40% of food produced worldwide is wasted. That's around 1.3 billion tons every year, costing the global economy the best part of a trillion dollars a year. And food waste from landfill produces methane, a greenhouse gas, way more potent than carbon dioxide. Wasting food is therefore a global emergency. Choco provides a digital solution which it believes would vastly reduce urgent levels of waste, feeding more and costing the planet less. I sat down at the COP28 talks here in Dubai to talk to the CEO and co-founder of Choco, Daniel Cushing. So, Daniel, COP28, the biggest gathering of its kind ever in the history of the world. Mm. Energy, of course, as always, will dominate, but there's plenty of other issues and you believe food waste should be up there, right? Yeah, I mean, in the end of the day, when you look at the carbon dioxide emissions, for example, of energy, it's around one-fourth of all. But food actually is also one-fourth. Now, what's particular about food is that we produce nearly double as much food as we need. Right? We have around 50% food waste, and so, so we could just half the carbon dioxide emissions from the food system if we just wouldn't farm all of the food that there is. And so we believe it's a very important point for the global agenda and something that we should speak about here. Some extraordinary numbers in there. Let's take this to the studio and talk in more detail. Let's do it. Okay, Daniel, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. First of all, then, tell us all about Choco. Yeah, so at Choco, we develop technology for global food supply chains in order to reduce food waste. So really, we have uh, different parts of technology for food distributors, so kind of companies that manage large quantities of food and deliver them to their customers, which could be restaurants, could be grocery stores, could be hotels. And we also have technology for them. And if the technology really does it, it helps them manage the operations and their inventory to be always in control of how much food they store, how much they purchase, and how much they waste. So we can optimize on that. Um, yeah, we do this really around the globe. Um, today we focus on, on, on Europe and the US. What sort of effect does that have on anyone who's using your system? Yeah. I think really mostly it's like, it's like two things. Um, the first one is to really help our, our customers to become more profitable by wasting less food. Because in the end of the day, food waste is one of the largest kind of environmental challenges that we have globally. But also really it's an economic challenge because if you're a business that, that buys food and then sells it, whether you're a restaurant who buys ingredients and sells it at dishes, whether you're a distributor who buys like, you know, tons of bananas and sells five of them. If, you have, if, if they go to waste within your operations, you're just losing potential profit, right? And so it's an environmental as much as an economic problem. And so we help them that just less of these, this food goes to waste. So they become more profitable. Um, and that's probably one of the main impacts. The second one would be our technology helps to automate a lot of the internal processes that they have in marketing their products in managing their customers and managing their orders. And so we also help, help our customers to reduce cost by, by using AI to automate many of the internal processes. So there's a lot in that. There's yeah. a lot of, that you're offering a lot. Um, what's the guiding principle? What's the problem that you're focusing on that you're trying to solve? Yeah. The dominating principle. Yeah, the dominating principle is reducing food waste. I think this is uh, this is very simple, and food waste is a very complex problem, it's a systemic problem. That's why also we're not like a spot solution to one part in the supply chain. Like we could go distributor only, or farmer only, or restaurant only. No, we have a product for all of them. And that product helps those businesses individually remove food waste. Um, but it also helps them in, in combination because at the end of the day, they transact. And if the restaurant over orders in bananas and has to throw them away, and then maybe a dispute doesn't, doesn't, doesn't cure the loss. Nevertheless, for the sake of the planet, bananas still lost. Right? And so this is why we need several parties across the whole chain on one single platform so we can help all of them. And while we're about it, I mean, is food sustainability limited to waste? It's a very interesting question because in the end of the day, when we look at some other major problems that we have on the planet, such, a, such as biodiversity, for example, around one third of global land surface, we use it for, for food production, which also means we deforestated forests and, and, and natural flora, flora and fauna and reduced a lot of biodiversity here to then grow in massive monocultures over and over the same crops and also deplete the soil over and over from the same nutrients. And so if a, a more sustainable food system also means driving more biodiversity in food production. It also means using fertilization um, and, uh, and, and pesticides that enable more di biodiversity and, and, and not reduce it. Sustainable food system also means being more regional. 
in the end of the day, no matter in which city we are today, if it's Dubai, Shanghai, New York or, or Berlin, we can eat, you know, a banana in all of those places every single day of the year, but it doesn't grow in any of those places, right? So I, I think um, a lot of enablement to local food production, transparency of local food supply chains will also be a massive contributor to a more sustainable food system. And further on in the interview, while we're talking about technology, what role does AI have to play down the line, do you think? So we believe AI will be a major contributor to digitizing the world's food system and bring it online and make it more sustainable. And the reason is that um, the, the food system as an industry, as previously mentioned, is one of the least digital industries of all. And so how do you bring a, bring a very little digital industry online? It's very tough when you go with like traditional methods of here's an app and here's some software and you may want to make people interact with the software that previously haven't. But with AI, we don't need to, right? Because suddenly we can communicate with a machine like we communicate with a human. We can speak to it and it's still a computer recognizing what it wants. We can text with it in an unstructured format and the computer will, computer will recognize it. So for us at Choco, we invest for over 12 months a lot in AI because we believe AI is basically the better interface to act, interact with in an industry that is not very digital. The second advantage of AI is that in the end of the day, it's, it's built on statistical models. And statistical models help us or can help us to predict the future. And that again is so vital in food because in the end of the day, we always need to know how much demand is there tomorrow, next month and next year. And kind of these algorithms ha can help us predict those as well. So to a layman like me, is that, is that taking a fresh look at the simple idea of supply and demand? Definitely. I mean, the problem in food supply chain is that supply and demand are not really talking to each other. You know, in the end of the day, if you're if you're a producer, say you, you produce mangoes, right? And mango grows on like a large tree. It's kind of hanging there. It's a large fruit. You can harvest it once a year. And you're just going to harvest a hundred of mangoes, but you actually don't know how much, are, how many are demanded. And so, so you have a hundred, you know, you might sell 90 to the harvest manager who then might sell 80 to the distributor who then might sell 60 into grocery stores or restaurants. And so each of these individual businesses occur a small loss, but in total, we lose 40 to 50%. And that is because actually it should be the other way around. We should know we need 60 mangoes and we should make sure that we only grow 60 and that out of the 60 that we grow 60 also arise so that we have an efficient supply chain. And so this is kind of one of the supply and demand principles that we're trying to create here. So here we are at COP28. Uh, Many more members of the private sector are here than in previous uh, meetings. Uh, but obviously energy and transportation will dominate as they, as they always do, and perhaps rightly so. But there's a huge wealth of sectors beneath those that have enormous effects on our climate, and they, they barely get a look in, if you like. I mean, should we start looking at prioritizing or rearranging the agenda? Yeah, I, I think it's very, very important. I mean, in the end of the day, when we look at climate change very methodically, then there's a couple of industries and each of them emit, uh, emits a certain part of all global greenhouse gases. And then we look at energy. The second one is, is food, also one fourth, 24%. And then by the way, like planes is, is 2%, right? And so um, the, the, the particularly interesting thing about food is that we produce nearly double as much food as we need. We, we, so we put inputs, you know, into the, into the fields and water and fertilizer, and we deforestate in the first place to grow the fields, so which means deforestation also means we reduce our ability to absorb greenhouse gases. We add chemicals, we cool it, we transport it, we package it, we clean it, we sell it, we throw it away. Which means that, okay, half, if we produce nearly double as much food as we need, then likely we can also halve our food production and still have enough food, which means we can also halve the greenhouse gas footprint of food. And, and this doesn't require us to, to, to reinvent the wheel. You know, we don't need electrification for that. We don't need um, uh, alternative proteins for that. We just need a very pragmatic resolve for waste. And so, so we think this should be a very high priority to a global community. I think what's interesting as well and strikes me while talking to you is that there's a huge cultural change in here. Mm. People are wasteful and they take food for granted. There's that. But there's also an economic argument as well about the practicalities of operating at this sort of, uh, at this sort of level. It's an intersection almost between culture and economics. Yeah, absolutely. And the problem is, I believe, in food supply chain is there's no real end-to-end -end accountability. You know, if we go back to the mango example, like I'm accountable 
um, as let's say the, the broker. I, I bought 90 mangoes and I sell 80. Okay, and then the distributor buys 80 and sells 70. But no one is accountable for the whole chain. And so technology just helps us to create that, right? Because we get all of those different businesses on the, on the same platform. And, um, and so as such culturally, each individual part might not even realize that yes, okay, like their individual impact might be smaller, but only when they also contribute, like that's why the problem is so complex when each individual tiny part contributes and we can solve a global problem. It's interesting you use that word accountability. I, mean, I think what you're doing here, and, I, and you've told me already, you are seeing results. You are being aware of being able already to make a difference. Do you think that's kind of a blueprint perhaps for other sectors to look at in terms of the, the gatherings here where people exchange ideas? So I do believe that we need really, really scaled solutions in all aspects of climate change. And I do believe that companies tend to be the organizations that scale the largest. And underlying to a company is an economically successful business model. And so I think that we have to find more of these business models in which the economic success translates in direct correlation to success or environmental success. So, so for us, it's like if our technology works well for one of our customers, for one, one of our users, then they're going to incur less waste and it's going to make them more profitable, right? But also there's going to be less waste, which is great for the, for, the, for the environment. And so here's a direct correlation. I think this is the kind of business models of which we need more for. Daniel, pleasure talking to you. Thanks very much. Likewise, thank you very much.